All right, what is up, everybody? Mark on the mic here with my good friend Brian from the uh, from the company Hush, from the, the content creators Hush. Indeed, uh, uh, we're at Argali HQ World Headquarters. Boise, here, Idaho. Here in Boise, Idaho. Lovely, by the way. I probably shouldn't, uh, you know, shout that from the rooftops too uh, too much. I feel like everybody's finding that out. Kind of a lot of people moved here in the last few years, Mark. Yeah. The secret is no longer. Ugh, I can see why. It's pretty <laughs> awesome. We went, uh, Graham and I went on a little hike this morning. Yeah. Went uh, to Table Rock. Beautiful. As they call it. Yeah, it was a nice, uh, nice little lake. I think, uh, you know, four miles out and back. Uh, yeah, lovely. Weather was great. A little bit of cloud cover. We do have some clouds, which is Just, uh, it's pretty ideal. It's about 90 degrees, but it's a dry heat. Man, that dry heat's a real thing. 100% I, a real thing. I agree. When uh, when I lived in Nebraska, in fact, when I when I ev- interviewed to work for Cabela's out there, it was uh, I think it was like July or something like that, and it was 102, and people kept going, oh, you know, but it's a dry heat, and I'm like, people, it is 102 degrees. Like, what are you even talking? Like, you know, like basically, like, shut it. Like, it's yeah. hot out. Then I went to Eastern Nebraska one summer though, where it wasn't even probably remotely close to that, and like you'd walk outside and you'd be like sopping wet, and I'm like, oh. Like dry heat, that's a real thing. Yeah, I mean, you, Wisconsin is not a dry heat. It's not, but it kind of has been this summer. Though. I have heard that. Yeah, it's been, uh, I'd say, uh, uh, the nicest summer since I've been there. It was like 15 years. You that's know? impressive. So not that good for the agriculture. Like we've been uh, absent a lot of rain. Yeah, uh, the old cornfields are a little lower than normal. They weren't, uh, yeah, they, they were struggling there for a little bit. But everything looks like it's on track now. Not that sure. anybody really cares. Maybe outside of Wisconsin, you probably don't care what our corn looks like. But it looks very tall. I do wonder, though, like how that's going to affect the actual corn itself. Did the plant grow tall with the influx of rain? But maybe, you know, I don't know. I don't know how that works. I don't either, Mark. I don't grow corn. But that's not here. why we're here to talk, Brian. We're not talking about corn. We're going to be talking a little bit about sagebrush. We are. Because, uh, well, let's talk about everything you guys do for those that might not be familiar. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, and then we'll uh, slide right into that uh, Brush for Bucks program. So Yeah, so Hush is uh, it's a company, a brand, if you will, that was created by two of my business partners and myself, uh, one of which had had some early success in his personal life surrounding uh, the world of YouTube and content creation. And so back in 2011, uh, gosh, more than 10 years ago now, he started a hunting channel on YouTube, hedging his bet that one day outdoor television may not be as strong as it once was, and maybe this new digital era will take shape. This newfangled YouTube. Correct. So we were uh, one of the first hunting channels that kind of came out and uh, started relationships with folks like Mark at Vortex many years ago, folks at First Light, Camp Chef, host of other people that bought into this vision we pitched them that one day there will be a lot of hunting content on YouTube, even though there wasn't currently. So that's kind of how we got started. We were able to layer in some lifestyle apparel and some additional things into kind of our business model. And over a lot of years, we eventually got to a point where all three of us could do it full time. We've been able to hire on a couple full time employees in addition to the three of us. And Lucky enough to wake up every day and do something that we love. Got a lot of tremendous support from partners like you guys at Vortex and others. And then just a whole lot of folks that have consumed our content or followed us on social, maybe even purchased themselves a hat. Yeah. No, you guys do a phenomenal job uh, in the YouTube game. Your apparel is just on point, like always super cool stuff. And and the people behind it, though, are the key. Like, like you said, like you guys are talented, you're visionaries, you know, you saw trends you you know early adopters of that platform and leveraging it to distribute content and at least you know in the hunting content world like in a in a new way yeah um but also like you have to be likable like you have to be good people you know which uh those aren't the easiest things to find all the time either you got to have good chemistry you know so like you, you there's definitely um well we we set we set up the reason we wanted to do it years and years ago it was uh number one was just to inspire some people to maybe get outside maybe they didn't have dads like we did that took us out hunting or fishing mm-hmm. or outdoors so that was a big part of it we wanted to raise more awareness about hunting access and habitat components of what we are all dealing with on a day-to-day basis and then we wanted to just give back be good stewards in our community both locally and as the hunting community in general so just trying to like help as much as we could. And back then we had no idea what it could become. 
Uh, we didn't have a clue at all. You know, Instagram was almost non-existent, very new. YouTube was so new. We were just pouring our hearts into something that we were passionate about and kind of just within, you know, maybe something will come of it. Maybe not. Mm-hmm. And we're fortunate enough that it's turned into a pretty cool thing. I think a lot of things are like that, though, where you just got to believe in it, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. And, 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 yeah, you're taking a risk. You are taking a chance. Like, you know, I mean, I guess it is possible that these things, you know, don't evolve the way they did over time. But also, like, I think as people, like, we have a tendency to be like, oh, man, you know, like, those guys just, you know, they just blew up. It's like, eh, like, it's not an overnight thing. Definitely you know? not. Um, at Vortex, we get that sometimes, like, oh, man, you guys just came out of nowhere. It's like, dude, if you knew, like, what the Hamilton family, you know, the sacrifices they made, the effort they put in, you know, the history behind Vortex before Vortex was even a thing. It's yep. like, I mean, there there's a lot of push and grind and sacrifice and taking chances and setbacks. Um, and anyway, it's just it's really cool to see where you guys have, where you've started, where things have gone. Um, and like I said, a lot of that's it's hard work and, and good people. And Thank you. you're talking a little bit about, um, you know, being, being stewards and we, uh, we kind of foreshadowed with that brush for bucks program a little bit. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So brush for bucks originated, uh, we got invited to a team building event from our friends at first light. Their corporate office is just maybe a couple hours away from Boise where we are right now. And they were planting sagebrush seedlings on some critical winter range habitat that had been burned by a fire. And so we, uh, we kind of mingled with some of the folks there. We're working pretty closely with uh, Ford, who's their director of conservation, and kind of just spun the idea of what if we could take your team building event and make it a, like a bigger event for more people to participate in. One of the things that we thought about is that a lot of conservation groups are doing amazing things. And sometimes they're not the greatest at showcasing what they're doing. Sometimes the community uh, and the folks that are participating in these different projects are maybe a little bit older demographic than the folks that are following our, our platform. And so could we leverage like what we've built in a positive way to get maybe the younger people more involved in boots on the ground work? You know, it's one thing to write a check um, to any of these organizations. It's certainly helpful. I know it goes a long ways, but it's a different thing to actually roll up your sleeves and go do work. And we wanted to try to do more work. And so with uh, with the kind of partnership with First Light in association with Idaho Fish and Game, we started developing a plan of how do we create this brush for bucks entity. And so uh, we were able to apply for some different grants through the Idaho Fish and Game which afforded us the ability to purchase a bunch of sagebrush and bitterbrush seedlings a year in advance. So it's a pretty time conducive process to get to where we can actually put these in the ground. And then we started uh, with our first event two years ago where we actually invited people. So we sold tickets uh, to the general public. We made it very exclusive. So 50 tickets, it's a hundred bucks a piece. They get a nice little swag goodie bag. They get to come out and do work with all of us. And ultimately, we put all that money raised back into the fund for perpetuating it for the next one. This past year, we increased it from 50 to 150, got some more partners involved, kind of made it a bit more of a festival feel. And honestly, we, we planted not, not far from where we are sitting right here, again, on some critical winter range habitat. And so collectively over the last three years, I think, let's see, we put in 31,000 plants in April this year, year before we did 11,600 and the year before that we probably did 2000. So we're starting to accumulate a pretty good amount of sage and bitterbrush seedlings going into the ground. Uh, Idaho Fish and Game is helping us identify different areas through their biologists. They're also partnering with BLM, private landowners. So it's a real collaborative effort. And again, we're just trying to get people out and have a great time. You know, we're going to feed them lunch. We're going to give them a bunch of plants to go put in the ground. We're going to raise money for a good cause and, and hopefully continually uh, make this even a bigger thing. So more recently, we've partnered with the Mule Deer Foundation as well. So they kind of jumped on board to help uh, facilitate and hold our funds. That way there's no kind of, I don't know, conflict of interest and we can oh, just sure. push through funding. Also set it up to where different people and organizations can make a tax deductible donation to the Mule Deer Foundation with the memo line reading Brush for Bucks. 
Okay. And does that um, kind of like earmark that for that? Okay. And then, so we have complete oversight of the funds and where they're spent. So it doesn't roll into like a general fund. We are able to kind of dictate what projects we are going to pick and choose. And we can essentially account for the money from where it gets donated or raised all the way down to the ground of what projects being done. So it was just a great opportunity to partner with somebody in the Mule Deer Foundation who has done a fantastic job on the conservation front, uh, specifically when it comes to deer. And then um, obviously just like help kind of take some of the burden off of us as we've grown this thing a little bit faster than maybe we expected. And so we're excited to kind of see where the future takes this. Uh, we're talking through plans for 2024 in the spring, uh, possibly a collaborative effort between the state of Idaho and the state of Utah. There's some areas where they have mule deer that live in Idaho, but they winter in Utah. So we're working kind of through the details of what that looks like and how we can kind of just continually build momentum from this, you know, gaining more exposure, gaining more partnerships, more funding to do more great things for, you know, mule deer and frankly, other animals, right? It's helping out pronghorn, sage grouse, turkeys, elk, you name it. Like it's, it's just a good benefit. So we've focused primarily on planting, uh, but we know there's a lot of other things that we can help with too. And so that could be, you know, lop and scatter juniper projects that could be improving fencing to more wildlife friendly fencing. It could be, you know, emergency feeding for mule deer. We had a really tough winter in a lot of parts Mm -hmm. of the West last year. So there's a lot of ways we could take it. Uh, whatever the case, we just know that, uh, anything that we do is going to be beneficial and hopefully we can just keep, keep building momentum from it. No, I mean, that, that's all just such, uh, amazing stuff. And like you said, it, there's so many great conservation orgs out there and they need funding, right? So they need those donations from, from the public, from, from sportsmen. Um, but it can be, you know, f- sometimes you feel like you're kind of donating into like this nebulous, you're like, you know, it's doing good things, but it's kind of, yeah. you you just don't have, I guess the, the tangible nature of it to know exactly like, you know, what good things happen. So I, I think that's one thing that's really unique about this is people can be like, Hey, I'm going to, you know, um, get involved with this specific, you know, aspect of conservation. I'm going to get my hands dirty. Um, you know, there, there's a team building and a teamwork component. You're out there with other like-minded people, uh, you know, uh, doing hard work and, and, and doing hard work that's important work to, to help, you know, mule deer and, and other wildlife that are dependent on uh, these critical habitats. That, and, uh, you know, with you guys improving them, it's just going to, you know, in, improve them. Yeah. I mean, you, when you look at the landscape out West and you see like a, a sagebrush or a big, you know, acreage of sagebrush, those, those plants are, are quite old. Mm-hmm. And so I think a lot of people take for granted that when these big fires come through and they burn hot, a lot of time the sagebrush just don't have the ability to regenerate, certainly not on the time parameters that biologists would, biologists, excuse me, would hope for. And so that's where we can come in and kind of help kickstart some of this stuff because what happens is a lot of times invasive uh, grasses and what have you will overtake the landscape. And so in a lot of cases uh, where elk could probably survive off of some of that in in really harsh conditions, you know, mule deer are much more sensitive. They, uh, they don't do well, you know, so there's stories that you may have heard, but a deer will be dead with a full belly of like cheatgrass, right? There's no nutritional value in there. And so, we're just trying to, you know, help perpetuate that growth again. You know, there's, uh, these organizations are doing this at scale, right? Like mule deer foundations, probably planting upwards of like a million plants and things of that nature. These are, this is a smaller, you know, niche kind of a thing, but we're hoping that the message grows mm-hmm. and collectively helps the whole entire, you know, conservation movement because mule deer, uh, they're just not as hardy as a white tailed deer, not as hardy as an elk. Mm-hmm. They're quite sensitive and they're dealing with more challenges from obviously fires and harsher winters, but a lot of, you know, development moving into their winter range and mm-hmm. migration corridor issues. So there's a whole host of things that are making their life a little more, more complicated. And so just another reason to kind of think about that. You know, we, we do as hunters, we're, we're great at capitalizing on the resources to go take. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just important that we also uh, make a focus to give as well. Absolutely. And I think, you know, it seems like it shouldn't be a challenge, but I think sometimes it is a challenge. You're like, well, what can I do? Yeah. You know, like what, you know, absolutely. Um, and you know, I mean, there's at least one answer to that question, you know, and you can get involved with this program and, and, uh, 
I don't know. It just sounds fun too. It's super fun. And we'd love to have you guys out next year. Generally we're doing it in April. Uh, not necessarily the most idealistic time for planting. I think the fall plant planting that they have done has proven to be more successful as far as what they're able to retain from plants that make it. Survival okay, gotcha. right. So a lot of it's predicated on moisture and time of year, you know, the quality of how the plants put in the ground. There's a lot of things where, you know, contracted folks that are professionals at this are going to have probably a higher success rate. But nonetheless, like we're doing what we can do and uh, Idaho Fish and Game will continually monitor these various planting signs that we've started mm -hmm. and kind of keep track and see how they do. And so it's also a cool thing where you can kind of go back, hopefully, you know, down the road many years, we can take back our kids and say, hey, you know, this is an area that we helped regenerate when we were younger. Yeah, super cool. And that's a question I was going to ask is if you've been able to look back and see like, you know, some of these plantings, you know, take foothold and, and grow. Cause you've been doing this for a couple so years now, right? Three years now, uh, two years where we're kind of hosting and running the event. The first year was kind of that a kickoff idea with first light, uh, headquarters and their, their employees. But yeah, they're just starting to kind of monitor going back and seeing what kind of survival rate. And unfortunately, like the reality is the survival rate of the plants are relatively low. You know, mm -hmm, you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're hoping for like 10% or better survival rate, which sounds terrible, but that's just the nature of like the game of, of what it is. And again, those seedlings take a full year to mature until they're basically a plug that you can put in the ground and mm -hmm. again, increasing the opportunity for them to survive. So there's a lot that goes into it and uh, a lot of agencies that are doing really great work, but it, I think th where we can thrive is just helping tell the story, mm -hmm. right? There's so many of these groups that we've talked about that are doing amazing things in so many different ways. And I think uh, whatever the case may be, find a conservation organization that you can align with, you know, and, and go see what you could do to help out. And I, I'm telling you, like, there's uh, there's something to be said about rolling up your sleeves and going and, and doing work in the field that's just really gratifying mm -hmm. um, comparatively to maybe just writing a check and letting somebody else do it. Yeah. Yeah. Super rewarding. Yeah. It's cool stuff. And, and it really is, you, you don't look, you know, I'm from the Pacific Northwest. So when I think of like, you know, an old growth tree, it's yeah. like some giant fir or cedar that, you know, but a lot of these, these sagebrush plants that, you know, you lose in a fire, like you said, they're, they can be like really old plants. I mean, they're like, it's like old growth sagebrush. It might sure. not be some towering thing, but it, it took a long time to establish its establish itself and get there. And like you said, to be able to go through and kickstart and rejuvenate those, uh, those plantings, um, keep the invasives out from taking over. Um, yeah, super important work on, on these critical winter range habitats where, um, you know, the deer and other critters, I mean, they, they need that if they're, if they're going to make it. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's been a fun learning process. You know, we've, we've had an opportunity to really elevate our knowledge of uh, mule deer and conservation and habitat. And I mean, the bottom line is they need improvements on their summer range just as much. Some would, would argue, honestly, that their summer range habitat is more critical to their survival than even their winter range. Okay. Gotcha. And uh, there's just like more and more data that's it's being learned by state agencies and biologists, particularly throughout these more challenging winters. And as they're enacting like feeding opportunities for mule deer and kind of, um, it's, uh, there's a lot of, in Utah anyways, there's a lot of private landowners that are investing a ton of their own money. So there's a, a guy that we've learned a lot from Daniel Richens at RNK hunting company. He owns a big CWMU and runs a big outfitting service, but he spends and invests a ton of time and money into feeding deer throughout the winter. Oh, wow. And, uh, one of the things like when you start feeding deer, you kind of have to continue it. Right. Right. So it's, uh, it's one of those deals where they're taking fat measurements from their rump, their brisket and a few other areas, and they can kind of predict the survival rate of a deer early on in the cycle of winter. And, um, where they have done this feeding you know, historically in their property, their results are just much greater than in an area nearby that isn't doing it. Gotcha. And so you hate to have to supplement feed, but in, in, you know, again, the deer are just in a challenging predicament in a lot of different ways. And they have learned that over time, like it's successful. Uh, but to the nature of the deer, because of being a browser versus a grazer, they're just, you, you got to be more conscious of when you begin the process and then once you start it, you got to feed them all the way until the end of winter. So it's a, it's a costly endeavor, uh, but it's been fun to learn more about all aspects of mule deer conservation, habitat, et cetera. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, and there is so much, I mean, I'm learning things just as you're 
talking through it. And I think that's one thing that sometimes gets overlooked, you know, maybe by people who don't hunt is like really how much hunters do care about these animals. Uh, not not in a purely selfish way. Like, you know, we, we've ingrained um, and integrated these animals into our lives. They're part of our lives. We care about them. And, you know, I always say that, you know, as hunters, we're amateur biologists and always always trying to yeah. get better, learn more. Um, and, you, you know, you're talking about data points there. And I think it's really cool that the plantings that you guys are doing that were that are maybe actually occurring at a different time than they traditionally might be. But that's giving the state, you know, data points sure. to work off of yep. and and, uh, you know, more. I don't know. The, mo the more knowledge, the more better and, and the more, you know sagebrush out there the better for for these critters because it is super important it is man it's been so fun and uh we couldn't do it without the the help and the guidance from so many folks at the idaho fishing game they've been really fantastic to work with and it's uh it's again we're excited for what the future holds right so we uh we're fortunate enough to have this community of people that has followed us that has been supportive of us and they're they're making this happen right they're buying these tickets for a hundred bucks they're investing their time to come out on a Saturday. You know, this year was happened to be during Easter weekend. So it was a Saturday before Easter, not the most idealistic time for a lot of folks. And they invested, you know, a full entire day. We, we were out there from basically 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. doing work and not a, a convenient area. And so that's the other just uh, <laughs> super humbling is to see the amount of folks that are willing to do that. But we have aspirations and hopes that we can maybe have other people that do similar stuff that we do in different parts of the geography of the U.S. Mm -hmm. that could maybe host similar events. Right. right. And maybe mule deer isn't the primary focus of the species, but it uh, it could be helping white-tailed deer or turkeys. It could be helping black-tailed deer, mm -hmm. you know all-encompassing but the same kind of notion or idea of hosting one of these type of events in association with a state agency maybe the mule deer foundation other partners and just again getting boots on the ground getting people with like-minded interests out to do something fun awesome brian nope i love it i appreciate appreciate you and all the hard work you guys are putting in and and the awareness that you're creating uh, i mean that that's a big deal right you know i mean you guys have a far reach and just like letting people know that these things are going on or it's something they can, you know, be thinking about or potentially sure. get involved in. And then, like you said, scaling it, uh, to, you know, other animals or other regions where, um, people can get involved and maybe this program, uh, evolves in, in their area a little, a little bit more as well. So, yeah, maybe, maybe the guys, the, the Vortex crew could host one, maybe, huh? maybe the Wisconsin one, maybe. maybe. Oh, it sounds like a good idea to me. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's roll our sleeves up. Let's plant some trees. Yeah. Get our hands dirty. Absolutely. No, we're excited for the future. And uh, yeah, if you guys are interested in learning more about it, you can check out our website. We have uh, an events tab and a brush for bucks tab that kind of detailed out. Again, we won't have any details on where it's happening just yet, but as we get closer towards the end of the year, we'll start materializing our plans for next April. 2024 okay. is when our next event will kick off. And yeah, I'm excited to, to see what this one does. Awesome, man. Well, me as well. All right. Well, Brian, thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody for listening. Uh, yeah, like Brian said, if you're interested in this, check out check out the the Hush channel. And uh, until next time, happy hunting and shooting and conservation. We'll catch you on the next one. Bye.